13th of November, 1971, Pink Floyd released their fifth studio album, Medal. In the years since, the record has been overshadowed by the exceptional success of Dark Side of the Moon, Wish You Were Here, and The Wall. However, despite its more obscure status, Medal is itself a remarkable piece of work. Medal's been lost along the way. It's probably the, the album from that period that most deserves a reappraisal. For the sort of, the, the slightly more curious, the slightly more, you know, inquisitive fan, it's always been up there as, as sort of an important work. For Echoes alone, you know, for the sheer ambition and scale of that track, it deserves to be retrieved. This film re-examines the album, how it came into being, and the music itself. The seeds of Pink Floyd were sown in Cambridge in the early 1960s, when Sid Barrett and Roger Waters became friends. However, this relationship would not blossom into a band until the pair moved to London. Pink Floyd initially formed in London as a five-piece, but the group eventually solidified with Sid Barrett on vocals and guitar, Rick Wright on keyboards, Nick Mason on drums, and Roger Waters on bass. Despite starting as an R&B group, the band quickly gravitated towards a newly emerging mid-60s sound. 66, 67, when Psychedelia started, it was like coming out of the black and white days of the 50s into the coloured, you know, technicolored days of the 60s, which is absolutely what it feels like now, because suddenly people were wearing coloured clothes and doing outrageous things. A lot of people in the British psychedelic movement in the 60s had grown up with the R&B boom, with the Mersey beat and so forth, the sound that really defined pop at the beginning of that decade. But as the decade wore on, they suddenly began to realise there's more to music than just strictly three-minute happy, happy, verse, chorus, verse, chorus, songs in the charts. And once they realised that, everything began to take off. American psychedelia developed principally on the west coast of the US, with bands like Jefferson Airplane, Love and The Birds defining the sound. However, in the UK, the scene was distinctly different. I suppose one of the significant differences is that it was more blues-based initially. A lot of it came, a lot of the people, a lot of the players, and people like Eric Clapton, for instance, who went on to be with Cream, have come out of that whole sort of blues tradition. And I think one of the points there was just the sort of, the sort of jamming aspects of, um, of things. The pivotal album in the UK was really, I suppose, what was Revolver, um, you know, with Tomorrow Never Knows, and various tracks, and then the track by George Harrison that sort of takes on the kind of Eastern influence. I think Pink Floyd are seen very much from the outside as being a part of that kind of British psychedelic movement. Obviously, Sid Barrett experimented a lot with hallucinogenics. That was a very big part of, of what Revolver, the Beatles' Revolver, was about. And I think there was an element of that in Floyd's music. Some of the, you know, it wasn't standard blues or country or folk. It didn't tend to lean on that as much as a lot of the American psychedelic bands did. Um, it, was, it was seen as being very out there, very left field. And so I think the way they looked and the way they played um, got them bracketed in as a, as a psychedelic band. Their musical and lyrical sensibility very much chimed um, with the times, uh, being kind of non-conformist, experimental, trying to expand the, the consciousness and expand the parameters of, of what's possible in music, I suppose. These sonic experiments were further influenced by the musical collective AMM, who Pink Floyd supported at Soho's Marquee Club. AMM were quite an astonishing group. They started musical life in the mid-60s, about 1965, 1966. Um, and they were this kind of 
very, very free playing, for want of a better word, jazz band, who were doing all kinds of sort of, you know, out, out there experiments. They were playing with saws and tuning in radios on stage. The guitarist would run, you know, ball bearings up and down the frets, the guitar. It's about expanded song forms and improvisation, and I think there are specifics as well. I mean, it's said that, uh, that Sid Barrett stole the idea of running ball bearings down the neck of his uh, guitar uh, from, from AMM. If you listen to early Pink Floyd, where they're kind of, where they're sort of having these kind of solid jams that are almost like approaching the states of white noise, you can see where AMM would have been hugely influential. This influence would lead to extended pieces such as Interstellar Overdrive, a song that has been credited with setting Pink Floyd on a path that would eventually lead them to albums like Metal. I think you could say that the, the very roots of the sort of Pink Floyd's progressive rock, it does come from Interstellar Overdrive, that's the obvious track. If you listen to things like Atom Heart Mother and Echoes, I think Installer Overdrive was obviously the starting point for, you know, these sort of long, epic sort of instrumental pieces. The idea of this long instrumental ramble is, is really where, it's the roots of where all Pink Floyd's longer and probably better instrumental rambles came from a lot later on. Pink Floyd's underground reputation grew to such an extent that eventually they were signed by EMI. However, their first single was not to be as confrontational as some of their live material. Lane was the first hit single for the Pink Floyd. It fitted into what was going on at the time, and it didn't fit into what was going on at the time. There was a certain darkness and eeriness and eccentricity to it. It had a real edge. What the Floyd seemed to be doing was taking the classic rock and roll or pop structure musically and playing around with it. They were messing with your head by knocking it around. So you ended up with something slightly skew with, but something that still had enough in there to appeal to the masses. Very clever balance. Yeah, it was a different thing, but I think they're they were lucky or they were clever to actually produce two singles like that because it really did lift them out of just being a kind of a cult band. With Arnold Lane and their second single, See Emily Play, gaining chart success, Pink Floyd entered Abbey Road Studios to record their first album. Piper of the Gates of Dawn, when we recorded that, that was the very first album that uh, I was going to record with the uh, Pink Floyd. But as the uh, songs came up, I suppose... As far as I was concerned, I, I can say it was in, intrigue, you know, I was, I was intrigued with... Uh, because I knew nothing about uh, psychedelia anyway. I mean, I was a jazz musician and, of course, I'd just not long finished recording three years with the, uh, with the Beatles. So uh, to suddenly... Uh, well, not suddenly, but to, to start to record this psychedelic... Uh, psychedelia, the songs, etc. That's the only word I can find, is in intrigue. Piper at the Gates of Dawn was released on the 5th of August, 1967. To this day, it is still seen as a true classic of British psychedelia. You could well describe Piper at the Gates of Dawn as the archetypal um, British um, you know, psychedelic album, more so in a way than Sergeant Pepper, which is, is sort of belongs somewhere else altogether, really. But I think with, with Piper at the Gates of Dawn, there is this kind of... You know, there's, there's this rawness, there's this sort of bizarre mixture on the one hand of pop novelty. I mean, these things getting in the charts. Same as you've got with Hendrix at the same time, pop novelty 
plus this kind of like raging sort of psychedelic white noise. But what made Piper at the Gates of Dawn stand apart from so much at the time was that it was eccentric, it was significant, it was eloquent, and all these were combined through Sid Barrett, who was a, a conduit for so much that was going on, so much that was dark, so much that was almost unnerving and a little bit difficult to comprehend. I still find Piper at Gates of Dawn to be um, a very impressive creation. I mean, we're talking about a record that was made nearly 40 years ago. It still stands. No, no question about that at all. You know, it is, it's still in a, absolutely in a class of its own. However, despite the success of Piper at the Gates of Dawn, all was not well within Pink Floyd. During 1967, Sid Barrett appeared to suffer a drug-induced mental breakdown, which resulted in ever-increasingly erratic behaviour. After a disastrous American tour, the band were forced to employ the services of another guitarist to supplement Barrett's now minimal contributions to live performances. They called on David Gilmore, an old Cambridge friend of Waters and Barrett. However, despite this attempt to sustain the group, in January 1968, Sid Barrett left Pink Floyd. I feel that the one album that Sid Barrett did with Pink Floyd, Piper of the Gates of Dawn, plus his two solo albums, really encapsulate brilliantly what that man was all about in a certain sense of his life. Four years, three albums, that's all it is, but it really does still capture the imagination because this is Sid Barrett. I think that when David Gilmore came along and replaced Sid Barrett after his uh, breakdown, Pink Floyd transformed completely. You might almost talk about it as a sort of direct transition from childhood to adulthood. I mean, the, the whole tone, the whole pulse of Pink Floyd changes completely. A lot of that, I think, is to do with, you know, the David Gilmore's style. He has this kind of very languid, very sort of liquid sort of approach to playing guitar, almost like heavy eyelid or whatever, very slow, very sort of laid back, but also very, very assured, very stately. And I think it's at this point that Pink Floyd take on certain airs and graces. They become a different kind of group. What Gilmore brought to the table was a musicality that Sid didn't have. He'd been in a Gilmore had been in a covers band in Cambridge. You know, he could sing anything. They were doing Four Seasons, Sam and Dave covers, Chuck Berry. He had a great, great voice, and he was a really, really good, proficient, kind of traditional guitar player, a tradition in the sense of blues playing. When Dave Gilmore arrived, of course, I mean, he was like a breath of fresh air uh, uh, after Sid Barrett, you know, the difficulty of, of dealing with Sid. Uh, but that, uh, David was, uh, as I said, you know, was... He was on a more uh, musical uh, appreciation of what I was trying to achieve in terms of, uh, of uh, a more melodic substance. Sid's departure threw the group into turmoil, not least because he had been the chief songwriter and frontman. After the dust had settled, it was Roger Waters who had become the band's new creative focus. The thing with Waters is he was the most, and probably the most obviously ambitious member of the group. Uh, he was probably the least musical, but he was the one with the drive and with the ideas and who wanted to be successful. He wanted to be in a famous rock band. Uh, and he sort of saw Sid's departure as somebody had to fill that gap. He was a more forceful personality than Rick Wright. And so he stepped up and his early songs aren't really very good, but he was at least coming up with songs and coming up with ideas. It was no surprise to me that uh, Roger would, would actually take over the, uh, the leadership. Uh, of, of Pink Floyd as it was then. I did always enjoy Roger's songs, purely because he was so easy to work with any, much easier than Sid, you know, to, to get my ideas across to him. Despite Barrett's disintegrating mental state, Pink Floyd had begun to record their second studio album. After Sid's departure, they set about completing what would eventually become a saucer full of secrets. A saucer full of secrets is a, is a real mixed bag because half Barrett's on some of it. He's got he's on one track, Jug Band Blues. He's supposedly playing guitar guitar on some others. There's stuff on there as well that's left over from Piper at the Gates of Dawn. So it's not a very cohesive record. Um, and also Gilmore had very very little input on it. He was basically doing he was playing on songs that had already been for the most part had already been written. Despite the unsatisfactory elements on the album, 
it does contain a song that would point in the direction of some of Pink Floyd's best work. Set the controls for the heart and the sun is the standout track on there because in a way that really does point the way forward to medal, uh, Atom Heart Mother medal, and eventually obviously dark, the dark side of the moon. Um, it's got that kind of sound which we associate now with that sort of late 60s progressive rock, space rock, whatever you want to call it. Set the controls for the heart of the sun. The actual lyrics are not so important. So when we'd sit back, the lyrics were very important. But now the lyrics were not so important, but the musical structure was more important. It kind of moved um, Pink Floyd away from, basically from inner space, from the reflection on inner space, to you know, the, re the real uh, and substantial a physical thing that was happening outside of them, which was the exploration of outer space. It's a very atmospheric piece of music. It's very much Roger Waters dominates completely. Uh, but you can you can hear where they're heading in the 70s. This is this is like a dry run. It's a kind of a follow-on, really, from Intercell Overdrive. I mean, they've already initially got this kind of rough outline of a sort of what you might call prog rock eventually, but a sort of intermediary thing, which is like space rock. Um, it's where they kind of really, it's almost like they've taken all the kind of energies that they sort of built up and used them as a sort of rocket booster to go to some new place to get away from this kind of, the sort of rootsier aspects of psychedelia, you know, the kind of, um, you know, the, 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 folk the folk influence, the blues influence, and, you know, and really take the music somewhere else. As the 1960s drew to a close, so did the idealism that had defined psychedelia. What was left musically began to mutate into what has become known as progressive rock. What we call progressive rock is basically rock music that's made after Sgt Pepper. I think Sgt Pepper is the point that changes it. It's the idea that suddenly a pop song didn't have to be three and a half minutes long, that you could do this, you could go here, you could go there. And a load of bands, British and American bands, were very much inspired by that. That was the first album where the studio was used as an instrument where avant-garde ideas, classical music were brought in, where you had orchestras, where you had this, where you had that, where you had the kitchen sink. And uh, so, I mean, I think, you know, the progressive rock probably started with Sgt. Pepper. Originally, it de developed from, from, from a need to do something counter to what other bands were doing, you know, to get away from the 12 bars and stop sounding like Americans. Um, and, and you'll find that most of that progressive rock of, of that time is, is um, almost unbearably English. Another album to define the genre and dramatically influence other progressive artists was King Crimson's In the Court of the Crimson King. King Crimson's uh, 1969 album In the Court of the Crimson King was the sort of main jumping off point of progressive rock. The purple piper plays his tune the choir softly sing Three lullabies in an ancient tongue For the court of the crimson The first commercially extremely uh, impactful, very big uh, album. It's also a unique record, it's never been repeated. Um, it's nothing like that record. And it's nothing like anything else around it. But to say that it's the first progressive rock record would be simplifying the case. You could argue that King Crimson were just taking ideas out of the sort of cultural ether that the idea of experimenting with the classical form and, and, and content that the Beatles had already begun upon and the, the moody blues that had been experimenting with, the use of um, early prototype synthesizers like the Mellotron to create uh, orchestral voicings in, in the sort of rock field, the influence of jazz, the influence of music concrete and of avant-garde experimental ideas, and the sort of the, the expansion of the lyrical palette to include myths and legends and uh, classical illusions. So King Crimson very much sort of uh, coalesced all these various ideas that had been floating around within psychedelic music, essentially, before that. At the beginning of the 1970s, the genre grew in popularity, with bands like Yes, Genesis, Emerson, Lake and Palmer, 
and Jethro Tull defining the movement's obsession with expanding the traditional rock song. We didn't have any restrictions, so it was really, well, if a piece lasts 20 minutes, so be it. We never went out of our way, and I don't think the other bands did, to write extra long pieces. But if that happened, that was fine. And also there was a very strong element of, of elitism. You know, we, most of the guys thought they were pretty hot stuff. It was taken to, to an extraordinary degree of, of uh, somewhat pom pompous um, and, and overblown. Uh, although I, love, I loved all that at the time. You know, I'll get shot for saying this. <laughs> there has long been debate over whether Pink Floyd are part of the prog rock movement of the early 70s and whether their next three albums, including Metal, represent their progressive period. They fitted into it more by accident than by design. I mean, you know, none of them were virtuoso musicians at that point. Um, probably least of all Nick Mason and Roger Waters, whereas in Yes, you had Bill Bruford, who was a jazz-trained drummer, and you had Chris Squire, who was a very proficient bass player. Floyd were much more traditional. It's very blues-based. They're not... They weren't virtuosos. So I think that, in a way, that stopped them getting... becoming too technical. Um, so the fact that the songs go on a long time and have a lot of time changes and so on is why they get... why they're often lumped in as progressive rock. I don't think it's a... Again, I don't think it's a tag that would sit very comfortably with them with the band themselves. People argue a lot about whether you can call Pink Floyd uh, progressive rock or not. Um, I very much think that you can, and as such, they're a pretty archetypal example of how the, the notions of psychedelia got expanded and, and ran with into the, into the 70s. Um, I think particularly in terms of expansion of song structure, um, the idea of incorporating classical elements into music, of incorporating avant-garde uh, movements. Pink Floyd's first entirely post-Barrett release was the film soundtrack, More, which, despite the limited success of the feature film, reached number nine in the UK charts. However, it was to be their next album that would truly demonstrate their progressive credentials. I think Um Gummer was the first time when uh, Pink Floyd decided they were going to make a, a completely progressive album. As such, the, the idea of, of dividing um, half of each side of the album to different members of the band was a kind of very archetypically progressive concept that they could experiment uh, with these chunks of time as, as they wished. I knew that they, or particularly Roger, and I, th I think the others, uh, had set themselves up with some kind of recording studio at home in their homes. So I encouraged them, in actual fact, to, to make tapes uh, at home and to bring them into me and, and we'd go over it together, etc. I did that individually. And so that's really at the start of the idea of uh, four different uh, quarters of that album. That's how it, how it began. And I, I encouraged them to do that. I, I thought that would be a very good idea for them to produce their own quarter. The band went into the studio individually to see what they could do creatively. Um, I think to some of the results are appalling. <laughs> the Nick Mason results should, you know, should never have been released. Um, Gilmore himself is ashamed of what he did in that. Yet, you know, a little bit of his stuff is, is, is OK. It's a reminder that Pink Floyd are very much more than the sum of their parts, you know, and I think that when it comes to their solo careers, I think Roger Waters in particular realised that, that, you know, they're never going to do anything that's going to measure up. Despite the solo quarters concept, the album reached number five in the UK charts on its release in October 1969. Its popularity was helped by the record's artwork and the fact that it was a double album containing a second disc of live material. I think the artwork is fantastic. You know, I mean, they put a lot of effort into the artwork. The whole idea of the receding images and reality and stuff. The other album, though, the live album, is very good. I think it benefits from the fact that it is recorded live, and so you've got this kind of echoey, kind of cavernous feel. And I think that it really encapsulates, you know, Pink Floyd as space rockers at their best. <laughs> 
Whiskey Point, a remote and barren blister of land in the American desert. As isolated as the face of the moon. The Brisky Point by Antonioni, I think, is a classic film because it features the Grateful Dead and the Stones. Most importantly, it features the Floyd. Despite the fact that Pink Floyd were originally commissioned to record the entire soundtrack and ended up by only contributing three songs to the film, Zabriskie Point still became both an artistic and commercial success. The soundtrack also became the first release to feature the Pink Floyd of the 1970s. However, their first studio album of the decade would include their most ambitious song so far. An entire side of the record was dedicated to the title song, Atom Heart Mother. Adam Hart, one of the tracks, I think is dated very badly. It's, it's this massive orchestral English kind of prog psychedelic thing. They'd been experimenting live with long pieces of music and different sections. They'd been doing this for about two years by the time they got to it. Half of this stuff never got recorded, got kind of split up and broken up into individual songs. But they mucking about with this for ages. Um, what they did was, with Atta Part Mother though, is they employed, they got an orchestra on board. Abbey Road's orchestral session players came in. Uh, the piece had been scored by a friend of theirs who was a, a kind of a composer called Ron Giesin who was also sort of a, a kind of a, an avant-garde musician, the poet in his own right, very strong personality. He was sort of, he was a friend of Roger Waters and Nick Mason's, and he was kind of entrusted with scoring this piece of music. They went off on tour. When they came back, they weren't entirely happy with what he'd done, and he probably wasn't entirely happy with their ideas. You know, they've both talked about this over the years. It's seen, I think somebody's, one of the band members described it as a failed experiment. In actual fact, it's just that what they ended up with probably wasn't quite the way they heard it in their heads. I think I'm probably a bit unique in thinking that the song Atom Heart Mother is actually any good. It, it doesn't seem to hold a great amount of favour with either Pink Floyd fans or, or Pink Floyd themselves, and it doesn't have very high critical currency, but... While some people see it's virtually only really as a, as a dry run for echoes, and, and certainly it, um, it shares a lot of musical and conceptual ideas in common with that piece, I think it has some validity in its own right. of it are very exciting and, and quite invigorating and um, one of the reasons I'm, I'm particularly fond of Atom Heart Mother is that um, it manages to be pseudo classical without somehow without being particularly pompous that it has a sort of nice sort of Ennio Morricone-ish western-y feel to it and it's quite warm for a, for a prog suite and quite melodic um, and it has moments of indulgence, I think, but overall, I, th I think it's quite successful. But as a suite of music, at one side of the vinyl, different tempos, different changes, there's some sort of weird Gregorian-style chanting in the middle. There's this fantastic kind of funky rock guitar thing, which you can hear them ripping off again later on Dark Side of the Moon. You, you, it's interesting to listen to now because it's all little ideas, little seeds of ideas that you know that you, you can hear them coming back to three or four years down the line. Again, it's, it, it, it's put together, though, in the same spirit as everything they've done since, since Sid Barrett left. It's like, well, let's kind of just try this and see what we can do. Despite the song's shortcomings, the album itself was extremely successful. The second side of the record contained more conventional songs and on its release in October 1970, it reached number one in the UK charts. However, crucially, Pink Floyd had begun to experiment with the long song form, a style of music they would come to master on their next album. When they started on metal, there was no great plan, no 
set idea about what they were going to do. So there was a slight sense that things were creatively stagnating and that what happened, they'd arrive in studios, they'd have to slightly cast around for, for things to sort of fill up the time on their albums. And I think that that process slightly came to a head during, during Metal when, they, when I think they, they were rather despairing about what they would be able to find to, to actually make an album. When they went into Abbey Road Studios in January of 1971 to make Metal, they um, didn't know what to do. So, you know, they, they, they decided that they would um, make sounds out of household objects. And they began recording bits and pieces in the studio which were given titles such as like Nothing Part 1, Nothing Part 2. I think it goes up to Nothing Part 32. It opened their eyes to what, came, what could be done uh, in terms of uh, getting these effects in, uh, in, in recording. The only one of those sounds that eventually was used was the, um, um, the sound of um, Rick Wright's uh, Steinway piano going through the microphone of a Hammond organ's l rotating Leslie cabinet speaker. People don't realise that this rotating Leslie cabinet in the bottom, it makes a very strange Doppler effect if you put a note through it. Watery, pingy sound of the piano. The starting point is supposedly that, 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 that wonderful sort of pinging keyboard sound at the beginning. Uh, very tuneful, very sort of doleful sound. It's something Rick Wright did. Again, possibly by an accident, they decided to keep it and they just worked, they worked with it from there. That single note would form the very heart of metal. Pink Floyd eventually developed the sound into one of the most extraordinary tracks they would ever record, another sidelong suite by the name of Echoes. It's almost like a showcase for what they could do when they put their minds to it. And that's the impression you get listening to Echoes, is that after a lot of experimentation, a lot of kind of floundering around in the dark, they kind of put their minds to something. You look at that weird pre-Dark Side the Moon, post-Sid Barrett time, and Echoes is, is, is the crowning glory from that. That's the, the, probably the most successful piece of music they did in that period, that, those sort of four or five years. Despite having composed one of their boldest statements, before the song could be released, they had to compose an entire other side. In reverse to Atom Heart Mother, the band decided to save Echoes for later in the album and open with the instrumental One of These Days. One of These Days is a great opening track on, on metal. It's got this really ominous bass. I think they've double-tracked the bass or done something with it. It, it, it. it sounds like a Doctor Who theme. It's got all kinds of sort of Ron Granger, BBC Radiophonics workshop sounds going on in there. I think they had been taken to the uh, BBC uh, sound effects studio. I don't know if that had any bearing on it. The story is that the track was much, much longer originally. Uh, you know, and I know some people involved with the album were very surprised when they heard the finished article because it had been kind of cut down to four or five minutes or whatever it is. But I think it's, it's a classic Pink Floyd instrumental. What I find amusing about one of these days is, is, is how it's reflective of the, of the way that Pink Floyd worked and of their, of their characters in that and Roger Waters walks in with, with this, you know, begins playing this bass riff and, um, his, and uh, he can't play it very well, essentially. So David Gilmour picks up another bass and plays it better. But for some reason, they, end up they both end up recording bass parts. And you just think, well, OK, that's probably to save arguments. And they're in different channels. And so you can actually tell which is Roger Waters because it's played worse, and his strings were completely knackered on his bass as well. And there's another really bright, well-played bass part on the other channel. And to me, it's just interesting that it, the reflective of, at the, that time, creative and useful tension between the pair of them that produced, you know, this quite interesting pull and push between these bass lines. <laughs> Metal was the first album that they, again, made extensive use of this Italian box called the Binson Echo Rec. Basically, it was one of the very early effects boxes. It could, like, do equalization, it could do reverb, it could do echo, it could echo delays, all this. And this is what um, Sid Barrett and Rick Wright used on the Piper at the Gates of Dawn. They decided that on metal they'd get back to using it because they were fiddling around with it and then somehow they got two bass guitars going through it at the same time. It was a massive wall of bass. And... The very distinctive thing about it was, is, is, is the bass, obviously, and it's got a slap echo on it, which, which is a very close repeat thing, so, so that when, when you play the note, it repeats 
a millisecond afterwards. And this, this is an old thing um, made famous by Sam Phillips with Sun Records on, on, on the early Elvis and Jerry Lee stuff. And, you know, you, you would have that um, amazing quality, you know, and, and it's a very promising start to an album. And, and you know, the, the guitar sound, the, the, the distorted slide guitar that David Gilmour is using, I mean, that's very, very effective. Days has that great guitar sound, great guitar solo from Dave Gilmore. It's quite a relief to hear him being kind of let off the leash after all this time because he, you know, he, he, what he does best, he's not being allowed to do on Source Full of Secrets. Things like I'm a gal, my world, let's, you know, let's, let's not really go there. And there's, there's snippets of his great playing on the soundtrack album, obviously, on more. Um, you know, and again on Atom Heart Mother, but it's brilliant to hear him really sort of let off the leash. He's a reticent kind of guy, and he's not somebody that would push himself forward. Certainly not in the late 60s when he joined an already established band, you know, uh, you know, Waters having, you know, grown up in Cambridge with Sid Barrett. He knew those guys from Cambridge, but he's stepping into another man's shoes, and it took a while for him to, to settle in and I think be allowed to do what he wants to do. By the time of metal, um, Dave Gilmore had become much more confident, I think, as a, as a composer. He'd contributed a solo composition to the Atom Heart Mother album and had been very integral to the composition of Atom Heart Mother itself. And he'd been in the band for some time by then, so I think he was feeling a lot more that he could push his, his weight around a bit. Really, it's... David Gilmour, who was becoming essence of Pink Floyd at that moment, Rick Wright, who, you know, did a lot initially, and his keyboard sound was kind of really, really you know, quite a significant aspect of that, is, is beginning to sort of recede and influence, is becoming more and more about his kind of, sort of one of his sort of textured sort of, you know, brush strokes and layers of, like, um, David Gilmour's guitar. And I think that he's almost becoming, as it were, the kind of material, the body of the Pink Floyd at that point. The next song on the album, A Pillow of Winds, was to be a much more gentle piece. I cringe at the title. You know, an awful lot of fun could be made of, of, of that title. I, I th actually, it's a very pretty piece, and, and it's got a nice... It's got that English folky feel to it that, you know, a lot of bands were, were getting into that, you know, traffic were around, and that, that kind of pastoral... Thing with, with, with acoustic guitars. Pink Floyd had, had been exploring this, this post-psychedelic pastoral side ever since um, Barrett had left, and um, it's, a very, it's a very English, um, gentle, slightly poetic, I suppose, romantic um, side of the band. But there's a very different sort of pastoral feel from Sid Barrett's used to sort of... OK, with Sid Barrett, it was this kind of sort of psychedelic hinterland of sort of bits of old half-remembered fairy tales, and it was like a population of scarecrows and gnomes, all of whom were taking on a kind of rather sinister quality. And I think with, when Pink Floyd do the same sort of thing on a, on a track like this, then it's, it's much, much more kind of... It's much more drowsy and just bucolic and pleasant and very, very hazy. A cloud of eider down draws around me, softening the sound For those who are used to Roger Waters, the, the sort of, you know, bitter misanthrope, it, it's quite weird to hear the lyrics of things like A Pillow of Winds because they're so sort of... It's almost purple in its poeticism. And, um, it, as I say, it's a very gentle side that some people regard at the time as rather bland, but I, I've always found it um, rather fetching and, and wistful, and it has it sort of takes you somewhere. In the same way that the, the, the sort of cosmic jamming takes you somewhere, I think that the more pastoral side sort of lulls you. It's like you're lying by a, a bubbling brook or something, or out in a summer meadow, and, you know, falling, sort of falling asleep and listening to something sort of half, half asleep, half awake. And deep beneath the ground, the earth 
It does sound very English folksy. It, 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 it sounds like a sort of song. It, it sounds, it reminds you of Cambridge in the 60s, which of course is where, where Gilmore and Waters had, had grown up. Um, I think that kind of that more gentle acoustic side to that album is possibly a little more inspired though by something like Crosby, Stills and Nash, that kind of West Coast rock, those kind of groups. I mean, Gilmore and Waters were both listening to that sort of stuff. They're both big Bob Dylan fans. And the Crosby, Stills and Nash album had come out in around 70. I think they'd probably done some more stuff by the time metal came out. And I, the impression I've always got is that there's a little bit of that. It's a bit of a West Coast influence in there. But of course, not being from the West Coast, it goes through the sort of filter, the Pink Floyd filter. And it makes you think of them sort of sitting by the River Cam, smoking a massive joint. Fearless is a sort of interesting um, song. I think it's only the, the second composition that David Gilmore and Roger Waters wrote together. In fact, when I interviewed David Gilmore once, he'd completely forgotten that he'd had any contribution to the song whatsoever, which is quite sweet in a way, considering you know, how, how much those two have, uh, have battled over such issues in subsequent years. Um, but I think it was um, Waters came up with the, with the riff, and I think Gilmore added, added the bridge, and Waters wrote the lyrics. And, this was the basis, would prove to be the basis for a very fruitful creative partnership that would come to pass over the next few years as, as both these players uh, played to their strength, really. Roger Waters' lyrical and, I think, conceptual gift. He had great musical ideas, even if he wasn't a fantastic musician. And uh, David Gilmour's way with a sort of wistful, slightly yearning tune. Fearless is an interesting case because here you've got uh, Dave Gilmour singing a lyric written by Roger Waters. And you can see the possible beginnings of a fault line that would eventually develop into the kind of schism that eventually did for the group. Um, and you can imagine there's probably a sort of mutual resentment on Dave Gilmore's part. There's perhaps a sort of thing that Roger Daltry sometimes felt when he was having to sing Pete Townsend lyrics that he was being a mouthpiece for somebody else's thoughts and ideas. Whereas Roger Waters, on the other hand, might have resented the fact that, you know, he'd written this thing but that somebody else is like singing it and sort of somebody else is up front and perhaps as it were taking more of the sort of credit and attention. This is one of the stronger tracks on the album. I mean, you've obviously got the sound of Liverpool football uh, supporters choir that kind of comes in at the end doing, doing a bit of uh, You'll Never Walk Alone, which is, you know, is now the thing we associate the most with the song. Um, in actual fact, though, it's quite a pointed Walter, Roger Waters lyric. Um, the idea of sort of getting on and doing whatever you want and uh, kind of damn the consequences and about having a bit of bravery and being, being your own man, if you like. And you can read into that what you like. There's some suggestion that it's about Sid Barrett. Fearless was partly inspired by, by Sid Barrett in that um, Barrett had taught Waters the tuning that he used to, cre to create the riff. And the lines about Fearlessly, the idiot face, the crowd um, have been speculated to be about Sid Barrett when he went through his phase of just strumming one chord and staring at the crowd while the, um, while the band were playing. So if you see the song as, in, at least in some ways, being about Barrett, um, then perhaps um, the use of the, of the Liverpool crowd singing You'll Never Walk Alone, which um, could be seen as a message to Barrett, you know, just, just a, a message of, of solidarity and compassion that um, Waters would actually tend to, to send out to his former bandmate throughout, throughout their subsequent career. Sad to I think, is one of those songs that Pink Floyd fans tend to vote as one of the worst Pink Floyd songs ever written, I think. Um, it seems a bit of a shame. It's a, it's a nice sort of amiable, jazzy, gentle, summery little song. Um, the title at least recalls um, the time when Pink Floyd were sort of based in, 
Saint-Tropez in the south of France um, a couple of years previously. It's about being in Saint-Tropez. I mean, they'd spent a lot of time out playing south of France. They be they'd become huge in Europe. Um, and they all took a holiday together down there and went out and, with their wives and children and roadies and uh, probably had some terrible arguments in between going off and playing some outdoor events. But from judging from the song, Ro Rod sounds like Roger Walters thinks of it very fondly. As I reach for a peach, slide a ride down behind a sofa in Saint Tropez. Breaking a stick with a brick on the sand, riding a wave in the wake of an old sedan. One of the tracks that you do think of as filler. This is what, probably one of the, the, the tracks that lets down the first side of metal. It raises the interesting question of whether Pink Floyd are more about text or texture, or whether they're about the songwriting or just about the kind of, as it were, the materiality of their sound. And I think that this track suggests the latter, that if you reduce Pink Floyd to just songs and just have a very low-key kind of accompaniment, then they're really not all that impressive. The final song on the first side of metal features an unusual cameo from Steve Marriott's dog, Seamus. Seamus is a, is a joke track that would probably seem like a good idea at the time to, to put it on the record, but it's just, I think, surprised... Again, it's supposedly it's supposed to have surprised some of the people who first heard, who'd been involved in the making of the record and then heard it and were surprised it went on there. I mean, Gilmore was... I think the story is Gilmore's famously looked after Steve Marriott's dog, uh, Seamus. When he was away on tour, Gilmore looked after the dog, did some house-sitting. Um, and it's like, hey, look, if I play the guitar or the harmonica, the dog howls. And it found its way onto the record. I think in context, it's a sort of harmless little doodle, really. You can't make any great claims for it. Um, but in the context of a sort of lazy, summery album, it sort of fits in this sort of gentle, strummed blues. And it's a very typically Pink Floyd idea, uh, the use of you know, another field recording, really, of, of, you know, of a dog baying as a, as a sort of musical element, using sound, sound effects as such, you know, non-musical sound effects as, a, as an integral element of the song. I mean, you kind of... It's something that they revisited later on, on animals' dogs in a much more sort of interesting and dark way, but in the context of this sort of gentle album, I think it kind of works. It's almost as if they've, um, you know, they've got two or three minutes to spare you know, before the big event of Side 2, and they're just saying, oh, well, let's uh, pass the time with a little campfire ditty. Um, it's a very, very disposable bit of whimsy. Metal is really, in, in lots of ways, half an album. It's really just a sort of showcase, I would say, for, for Echoes. I think that the, 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 the tracks preceding it are quite interesting, they're a bit of a mixed bag, but really they're just sort of little mini tasters for, as it were, the main event. The entire second side of the LP was given over to one song alone, the epic Echoes. Perhaps it's the pulse, the pace at which Pink Floyd work, that they sometimes seem very, very sort of languid, to the extent of almost sort of aimlessness. It's almost like they're sort of not quite sure what their purpose is, where they're going, what they're, what they're trying to do. And it's only perhaps when you, you reach the sort of the great magnum opus that is Echoes that you get this kind of full realisation of um, perhaps what they've been looking to do for a few years. Echoes is another side-long piece of music, 20-minute piece of music. Um, it's a huge step on from Atom Heart Mother, though, because... As a piece of music, it flows much more seamlessly than Atom Heart Mother did. You haven't got the choir or the orchestra on there, which you had with Atom Heart Mother. It's very much about, all about the four of them. Echoes was the transplanting of what you would call, you know, a, a symphonic or, um, you know, a movement structure of classical music to what we, we would call head music. It's interesting the way that all the parts of Echoes work together. I mean, you, you, I mean, you can create, you can always create your own mental sort of images for it, really. I mean, you could see 
the very, very opening is a kind of submarine kind of rising to the surface. And then as it does so, you could sort of imagine, you know, like staring out of a porthole and picking out the kind of the glitter of the sea in the early morning sun. It sort of like sort of merges serenely into the kind of to the main theme of the song, you know, the main sort of the lyrical bulk. Most of the lyrics of Pink Lord are sung by David Gilmore and Rick Wright together. Not just David Gilmore on his own, but to get that soft and burring sound together. We people seem to never talk about this. Strangers passing in the street by chance two separate glances meet. And I am what I see is me. And I am you and what I see is me. When I was first listening to that, I just thought it was one of those sort of little tongue twisting, kind of logic twisting lines that you sometimes get in things that were aspiring to be poetic, and particularly in post psychedelic things. And, but Waters has pointed out that, that what that's about it is compassion and, and empathy and, and, and seeing yourself in others. And as such, he very much sees that as the sort of essence of his, of his work as a, as a writer. And he used to look out the window of this flat and see all these commuters backwards and forwards, going backwards and forwards up the Goldhawk Road, going to work, going to the station and so on. And it was about that idea of people kind of passing in the street and, and so on. So it, what he was muddling his way towards was a more kind of grounded sound, a more real sound. Despite all the prog rock uh, connotations of the music, he was trying to write about real issues. I think the lyrics see him moving between the more sort of lyrical, post-psychedelic, slightly sort of cosmic musings that had been sort of uh, afflicting Pink Floyd and, and their contemporaries for some time. Um, and something a little bit more rooted in the everyday in the sort of humanistic and material concerns that would come to dominate um, Pink Floyd um, from Dark Side of the Moon onwards. And then there's this rather sort of choppy section um, with the kind of interplay between David Gilmore and um, Rick Wright on sort of, you know, right, you know guitar and, and organ. <laughs> It's an absolute masterclass in the combining guitar with keyboard. I mean, it's a keyboard, the keyboard and guitar literally uh, have a conversation all the way through that, which is so subtle. And it's almost like that's telepathic. And I, I think this is, this is the thing that really makes, lifts it up. And then you've got this kind of wonderful sort of like gloomy maelstrom, you know, that sort of, um, and then the sort of the whale song section um, in which there's this sort of, sudden sense of being completely adrift and disorientated and like far, far from land and all bearings lost. The strange kind of nightmarish uh, section in the middle, which is quite, you know, quite it's not the kind of thing you'd want to listen to with headphones on and the lights out. And then gradually sort of moving back, you know, you might say, you know, to shore, whatever, and then there's a sort of sort of serene, triumphant sort of um, air and light, you know, flotilla around you. What I think makes Echoes stand aside from a lot of other uh, progressive rock's longer tunes is the fact that it's actually reasonably cohesive and simple for over its 25 odd minute length. Um, it's got a nice sort of circular structure to it. It, it starts and ends with, um, with a song essentially, with an instrumental passage going into a song at the beginning and a song sort of eking out to an instrumental passage at the end. As a piece of music, it's hard to be. Musically, it's one heck of a piece of music. It's, um, it's, it's so, um, it's got such cunning um, edits in it, and it's put together with so much skill, but also it, it, it evolves and it can be played live. 
When the album was released, it was marked by a rather opaque sleeve design. For the band who would produce some of the most iconic album art of the 20th century, the medal sleeve seems to have been somewhat forgotten. The artwork of medal is an interesting case in point. Um, Storm Thorgerson um, had actually provided the photo for Asm Hart Mother, the very, very famous photo of just a cow, which is a sort of strangely sort of surreally inconsequential image. And um, when they're looking for artwork for medal, he came up with the idea of a baboon's arse which um, he put it to the group. Uh, I think the group were in another part of the world at the time, and I think they kind of scratched their chins collectively and suggested that perhaps it wasn't the kind of image that they wanted um, to represent this particular uh, piece of work. And they themselves um, came up with the idea of um, an ear underwater. I mean, the reason why I love the cover is because you look at it, it looks like a camel's head. I know it sounds bizarre, but it does look like a camel's head. If you take the uh, shadow of the ear, and then if you think, think that's actually a thing itself, it looks like the eye of a, you know, a camel's neck and stuff. And I think it has many interpretations. And, you know, only, only when I was much older, older did someone tell me to turn it on, it's like, open up, it's an ear. And I didn't realize it is an ear, yeah. I didn't even know what it was, you know. As a 12-year-old child, when I first looked at that album, you know, an, an older boy at school lent it, lent it to me, and I just spent, you know, hours gazing at this image. I didn't know it was an ear or whatever it was, and this, you know, ear submerged in water that seemed to speak, you know, sort of very deeply to me about sort of all sorts of mystical, cosmic things that I couldn't begin to comprehend, and it seemed to completely tie in with the, the sort of incredible, sort of expansive cosmic music I was hearing, particularly on side two, on, on Echoes. On its release on November the 13th, 1971, Medal quickly rose to number three in the UK charts. Medal's kind of a strange album, but I think, I think it does work as a whole. I think that one of these days and echoes sort of create bookends for the, for the sort of lighter material inside, and you sort of need that lighter, gentler material as a nice sort of intermission, perhaps, between these two sort of larger, more expansive cosmic songs. Despite the contemporary success of the record, Medal has been somewhat overshadowed by the extraordinary success of Pink Floyd's next studio album, Dark Side of the Moon. Medal seems to actually represent a kind of end in itself. Once, once they've done Medal, it seems like they've got to perhaps sort of completely rethink what kind of group they are, what they're going to do next. Um, and so when you get to Dark Side of the Moon, it seems that um, they've, they, they've been sort of thinking about what kind of, you know, where they're going, what kind of group they're going to be. They've perhaps sort of started thinking again, maybe from scratch to some extent, having achieved what they achieved on metal. It's both the end of one era and the beginning of the other. Um, it def you know, once you get to Dark Side of the Moon, it's a different band in, in, a, lot of, in a lot of ways. Um, there are many elements on the Dark Side of the Moon that you can hear being road tested on metal. But Dark Side the Moon wouldn't sound in that way without an album such as Metal. You know, the leap from Metal to Dark Side the Moon is much, much smaller than it would have been, say, from Atom Heart Mother or Amagama. Despite Metal's slightly lost status, the album, and in particular Echoes, has become a powerful influence on artists like The Orb and even Radiohead. And of course it would be attempted for anybody who was interested in, in sound research down the line, you see. I think just the sort of sheer ambition, you know, the sonic ambition, for example, um, and I think that's sort of later provided kind of resource for people like um, The Orb, you know, and people like the whole post-rock brigade. <laughs> Floyd became like the, the kind of the spiritual leaders of all the um, ambient house people, and that's why eventually the Orb and the Floyd are they they were they were photographed on the front of uh, Melody Maker when the Orb had become superstars. So it's kind of interesting that the Orb became superstars sampling the Floyd, and the, uh, and they were the only band that, that 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 were sampled. You know, there was no sampling of King Crimson or Yes or Emerson Lake or Palmer. So why were the Floyd sampled? And it's a kind of an interesting thing. And, and to see the Floyd with the orb, that was just a, such a massive generational crossover as well. Mm -hmm. 
Despite the focus on some of Pink Floyd's other work, Medal is still a truly remarkable album and represents a crucial point in the band's development. I think you could make a case for, for Medal as being sort of the great overlooked Pink Floyd album, the great lost Pink Floyd album, if you, if you want. Um, because, of course, it, there's so much focus on the Dark Side of the Moon and there's also so much focus on the, the Sid Barrett era, which, of course, is a very short period of time. Um, it's only really the one album. So I think with Medal, it's kind of, Medal's been lost along the way. Medal is often forgotten in the in the way people look at it, but I mean, the people should go back to it now. I think what it represents is that they finally found themselves, their true selves. 